got us right in. Mm -hmm. Well, we have this conversation about target date funds. And so my question. Did you guys know that I invented for you, target date funds? Yeah, apparently. Very smart 401k Nobody cares. studying individuals is how are target date funds being chosen today by your plan sponsors, by your prospects, uh, with help from your advisors? How do they decide amongst the universe of target date funds which one will be appropriate for them? It's a two-step process. Always got to break it down into a process. It does. It is. It, does the provider allow me to choose more than one target date fund family? Step so one. So first off, there are many Bless out you. there that don't give you any choice. There's still some that don't. You're using proprietary target date suite based upon the product you're choosing. I'm not mm -hmm. going to put you on blast. I don't want to upset any of our. Why do we keep saying on partners? blast? You just brought because it up. Justin oh, just said, brought it up yeah. actually. Oh, he's gotten very comfortable in his position over there now. <laughs> um, as far away from Justin as possible. Are there really still? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, like I can. And they're they're. Them. I'll be quite honest. Their approach is it's not a proprietary suite because it's a multi-manager approach. They're not offering only their underlying core menu funds and the target date fund. It's a multi-manager approach. I don't. I want to bring up names. I'm not going to. No, don't. Okay. So that's the first one. So an advisor is looking and saying, is the product that's going to be chosen giving me access to multiple families or only one? The second is, I'm just being completely honest, is Vanguard available? Oh, geez. Because most advisors are looking to drive down the total cost of the core menu, and they know that that's a way to do it when they're in a competitive situation. I can't believe you just went there. That <laughs> So that's the one, two. I get the one, like, all right, well, do we even have a choice? Because if you've decided to go with Record Keeper A and there's no choice, well, then you're kind of stuck. But if you're going, and, and can I please say, most Record Keepers do have a lot of choice right now, right? Yeah. Uh, by the way, options. viewers, we are in an office, so you, you may hear some phone calls here and there. Um, Many of them have choice. Um, and so then if you, you have a choice, how are you choosing? And okay, and you're saying, well, the next question is, do you have Vanguard? And well, we're uh, going to talk about this uh, a little bit. Arguably, later. what many of them will say is, we know that the majority of the assets are going to roll into these funds, and we know that the yeah. participants that are going to put their money in there are not going to play an active role within the, the decision. So let's use the lowest possible cost option that we can find because cost is a big headwind to returns. Okay. Yeah, so at least there's some thought there. And we're going to talk about that um, as we come back to this in a little more detail in terms of the passive versus active because it's definitely part of it. And so we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, so stay tuned. During the show, we're going to dive deeper into this choice of target date funds. But for now, the most important thing is, well, let me first welcome everybody. Everybody out there in the 401k world, advisors, Yay. industry professionals, crazy people that just watch 401k videos on YouTube, which is kind of weird. Um, welcome to Retire Hollocks. Those are Episode our kind of people. Episode number uno cuatro. 14? 14. I'm pretty sure that's not how you said 14, but you just said one and four. So oh, good kind point. Of works. Yeah, what do we got? Well, one, four, you could say. Equinox? Right? He's always got to be so specific. Equinox. Hang on. Lagunitas. I'm here with my friends. Justin, Chad, Mark, Jake, pretty got, busy. Look at and because you forgot when he left. Yeah. Free hole. <laughs> oh, he ran away. <laughs> hey, oh my gosh. I just noticed this, by the way. I'm not sure who who bought the beer for this episode, but take a look at the top. Yeah, I was shocked. You can see that. it right, right there. Well, I'm gonna try to zoom in on this. This could get dangerous. So let me grab this one so I can read it at the same time. Lagunitas Equinox first brewed in genuine pale oat ale. The oat. very top it says 401k. 301k, 201k. I'm really mad. I've never, I've never Give been Give me a huge favor. I'm mic'd up. And I and get in there. Can you grab my little master mug right here? I love it. It's that. right here. I, I grab That's it. awesome. Do, do we You're know just noticing that? that and we've that? had Lagunitas a number of times, obviously. This Local big brood, guy. Petaluma. There's Thank another you. great brewery up there as well, Petaluma Hills. Wow. Great place weird. to be. Plug, plug. But it is a pale oat ale, is what it states. Oh, now, one thing we need again. to get back to here, Chad, is we have not have you give us your opinion on the beer. I have not given a description shows. in the last few episodes. Smell it. Thank goodness I didn't the last one, because the last one was rough. 
That beer was not tasty. Do you smell beer before you drink it? Did they yeah, say about like, that beer we had the other night? It was earthy. Ooh, it earthy. Good. I don't yeah. smell anything, brother. Really? Dirty yeah. and smell with the cold. I, I do not smell it. Yeah, just, no. Because my daughter smashed me in the face with her skull oh, the other day. Yeah, that's a good thing about having a mustache is you can save beer for later. Yeah, you can dip gross. your beard, beard in it. All right, Jason, <laughs> I will give you a... By the way, is that a hockey beard? Have you seen Playoff. these guys? A little bitter. No. A little bit. A little yeah. bitter. Give me that. Some good beer. Giant. Refreshing, players, though. Baseball mm-hmm. players. Crisp. Mm-hmm. Malt. A little malt to it. A little malty. Did you Google, like, synonyms for that's a sure word? I see we're getting with the crisp. <laughs> yeah. <but. laughs> yes. What'd you ask? Did I Google Are you paying attention? for the same yeah. word? I do want free holy on the show. If you Preach. Ever, ever, like... <laughs> Come on, buddy. You're part of the show. I'm sorry. I like it. I'm sorry I didn't bring your name up first. That's we should say go to next to JD. All right, guys. As much as people love to watch us drink beer and chatter, I think they also want to hear a little bit about this 401k stuff. Oh, hey, bud. Yeah, you're going front and center. So let's dive deeper into the target date fund selection. And uh, I kind of threw along an article to you guys on Plant Sponsor Magazine, right, for us to read. Um, that talked we about were supposed to read that? the four <laughs> the four steps in order, mind you, of choosing a target date fund that, that plan sponsors and I guess our advisors should follow. Yes? You know how passionate I am about this because we've talked about it a number of times. Yes, plan sponsors should follow this, Chad but Johansson I just want to see a process. I just want to see a damn process. I want to see advisors and plan sponsors consider what suite they're using. Show some sort of due diligence in that process. We know that 70% of the dollars are going to flow into target date funds. So spend some time figuring out what fits your demographic. Is it still 70%? Has that gone up? Right, where did, where's, can you please tell me where you got that number from? It's, well, 70, it's just about everywhere. It's 74.5. So you're wrong. Wow. Uh-huh. You were wrong. I, I mean, made that up. I said about. So actually, I caveat it. The point, well, about is, means it's the point is, is that what everyone understands out there is in the if game the lion's right, share of the assets, we're talking staircase. If the lion's share of the assets <laughs> are going into these types of investments, then obviously they need to have the highest level of scrutiny and/or attention. And and by the way, if you're not a 300-person, $20 million plan um, that has the time for this time type of scrutiny, we still feel like it's important for advisors to walk into that. 10 person $1 million plan and say, let's still spend some time on this, right? Let's make sure we make a logical decision. Because not every target date fund is created equally and every type of employer has a a target date fund that fits better than others based upon the demographics. Add it to your game, right? Yeah. I need it both hands, right? I mean, every time we talk about hashtag not your typical advisor, this is a great way to differentiate yourself. Because everyone else is just checking the box. Oh, this is your target date. So let's talk about it then. Let's dive in. Let's talk about the four points that uh, we kind of stole here from plan sponsor. Uh, number one, which isn't going to come as a shocker, but let's, number let's, one thing. I'm pretty sure it's Morningstar, isn't it? It was oh, a Morningstar sure. link. Oh, can I first clarify? Thanks. Well, do you remember? You got to do what plan first? Sponsor. You you've got to first determine who are your people, who yeah, are your participants, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. So sorry. First determine what's your demographic. Age, risk right? tolerance. All those things. Yeah, the um, type of people that you employ. Yeah. Are they, I hate to should say Should have it. an effect on that decision. Yeah, what's their salary rate? How, mm-hmm. What's their tendencies? How might they retire? How long are they going to work? I mean, And that's going to help you get through these next <clears throat> What's their intelligence and understanding of risk? And are they risk adverse or not? So all those types of decisions. So now you know who your people are, generally. Now there are four things to consider. And they say the number one thing, which I said wouldn't come as a shock, is glide path. <gasps> Oh, can I'm shocked. Shock Mark. <laughs> Mark doesn't know what a fiduciary is, so <laughs> you still haven't told me. <laughs> We're holding that back. You'll uh-huh. get that sometime next year. There's a um, definition that's recently released. It um, glide path, and I guess you could say, what do I mean by glide through? path? You can say to and through. Fine. That's 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 the same kind of thing. You think, of, think of, of wee. Yes. I actually, I do. Right? I really very do. Close Unless you're yeah. American Century and you're flat, and you're like wee. Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah, you're not wee. They say f- flat is fat. And I say fat, I mean P-H-A-T, fat. Kind of an 80s thing. <laughs> um, so your glide path, which, duh. Of course, that's the, the biggest thing to consider because it's going to have the most impact on 
the outcomes of that type of investment. Um, I should pull up. You guys studied all this. Number two. You're absolutely cheating, by the way, totally. by having a laptop. In number front two. Of you. Number two. You guys gonna? You guys studied it. What's number two? You guys studied it, didn't you? Asset class ex exposure. exposure. Oh, that's what I meant. To Sorry. infer, to, to Making sure ensure that you have fixed mm -hmm. in there and it's that you have some good exposure. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you've got a glide path. And does a glide path mean you have equity versus bonds and cash for sure? But now they're saying number two is dive deeper. What's the asset allocation within the equity? Right. What types of classes are they well, using? And what's the allocation within the bonds? And how does it vary along that glide path, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but they first talk about exposure and then they talk about physical allocation, right? Yeah, yeah, true. And they include three. fixed income. No, so step three yeah, is the, the asset allocation methodology and how the allocations in the glide path change over time. Yeah, right. Chad's right, I was wrong. <laughs> and so it, it has to do, and you hear this. And he didn't even read it, the article. Not all target date funds are created equal. You talk about equity exposure at the beginning and the steepness of their glide path and equity two exposure versus route, three. two versus through, and the allocation within there. There are a few active managed target date funds, since I gave the plug to Vanguard earlier, some active managers hey, that's out the fourth there. point. Don't yes. go ahead. Yeah. Jesus. So, but that's good that he said that. So what's the fourth point? We didn't know three yet. We, we just did methodology. Methodology. Yeah. The last one, number four. <laughs> that was an honest mistake. Number four is the big debate, right? Active versus passive. Or both. Um, or you know, there are some out there that are mixing, you know, just, but, but the concept is, are you going to choose an active-based target date fund or passive-based fund? Or, yeah, sure, some that has a mix of both. Um, and that's that's number four. They're saying. I don't um, like how you when you said both, you were kind of dismissive yeah. of it. Can you? I'm just I'm just curious. So like, what are your thoughts there on are that? target date funds out there that have said, "Hey, we've decided that within this type of asset class, say international, for an example, we think there's a lot of benefit <clears throat> to being actively managed in this space. Right. But when it comes to something like U.S. equity, maybe we want to be passive. Or and I'm just making up some stuff right. here. But that's the concept is. You could mix and match with things like that, right? But so you, you don't, don't have to you be don't all or nothing. You think that's a good mix? Oh, I think or? it could be great. It makes okay. a lot of logical sense, for sure. I mean, it's just not something that a lot of them are doing right now? Um, are a lot of them doing? Um, I would say about 27.3% of all target date funds. I'm going to go, Chad. I'm going to call bolt. No, so, yeah, there's here's, a fair, that's probably not far off. I here's a question I've been asked regarding active versus passive in the target date suite. Isn't the fact that they are actively picking the allocation, the glide path, the two verse through, make it almost an actively managed fund? I get it that the, the underlying investments are passive in nature, but they're taking an active management role in determining the allocation, the breakdown, the timing, the glide path, all of that is active. That's a fair point, but that's, it's that's like not active, what they're saying. It's like active but passive. Saying, the funds that you choose within that fund, are they actively managed or are they passive? I but yeah, it. I get what you're I saying. I get it. I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Huh. Um, and then this goes back to what you said originally. You said point one, point two, point one. what record keeper they're using. Do they have a choice? Point two, you said, <laughs> do they have Vanguard? <laughs> And so here we are. Apparently, it's, plan sponsor disagrees with you. They think that's the fourth choice, but. Well, and all, all I was stating with that is that most advisors in a competitive situation, they want to come in with the most aggressive possible costs available to them. And so often, if you mix in 12 funds that are at 18 basis points, like Vanguard, you can roll in with a much lower cost fund lineup. Yep. And that's what they're doing. Now, I, what I love, and I know I've told you guys this for a while, when you're sitting with advisors, is to say, hey, I'm honest, honestly, I'm even fine with you showing Vanguard initially as part of your point of sale to show, hey, here's, here's what a lineup could look like. But let's sit down and talk about what fits you as a business and your demographics, like you guys mentioned, and let's determine if Vanguard's right then at that point. Right. I've seen an advisor show a low cost, like he'll pick a provider that fits the client, he'll show a low cost and a recommended lineup. And he'll say, hey, you want me to be low cost? You want to use Vanguard DFA passive? Here you go. You want me to come in and help you select the best in class lineup? It's not going to be the lowest cost options. We'll use Vanguard in the blend, and then we'll use active management and growth and value. I, 
that's I'm kind that's, of on the fence. Right. I was gonna say that's not every advisor. Though. No, not. But no. it, I definitely think it shows a lot of value there. He's put. That's a great. That's what we do. That's why we hashtagged it. it, right? I mean, those are people Sorry. making it. Really no one else hashtagged it but practice. Chad. Yeah. So, so we did. It was a mutual agreement. Two Your things. Hashtag is not for all of us. Two things I want to do to to kind of wrap this segment. In. One is that I'm kind of uncomfortable with the fact that because of the fiduciary rules, because of the fee disclosure rules that came out several years ago that all of a sudden that the answer to that is Vanguard or passive investing. Like that makes me a little uncomfortable because I believe that you it You don't get uncomfortable very easily. I believe that it really is a debate between active and passive. That's a great debate. Have it. Right. And and I don't care I'm in the middle on that. Like I see both sides. But when you're in this kind of scrutinizing fees and now you're going to use passive as your way to show lower fees. I feel like there's a little bit of a game being played there. But oh, that, but for that's, sure. That's just where I'm at. Well, and if you, you believe in passive people... funds and that's where your heart's at, yeah. I'm behind you. That's great. And I think go for it and, and go out there and share that message. But I just feel like it's a bit of smoke and mirrors to be running around talking about lowering costs by doing that. Although yeah, oh. maybe that's the heart of their argument in the first place. Well, do you think it's a result of it is. the new regs coming out and people wanting to... Yeah. Getting the costs well, and worried about lawsuits and stuff like that. I think that that's a perfect bridge th that we're going to stall for a second, but into the last topic that we're going to chat about today is it? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, um, pay attention to that. But one little side thing, um, and maybe we can put it in our. We don't really have show notes, but I hear other like podcasts talk about their show notes, so that's pretty cool. But show it seems notes? way too professional. Yeah, which means like little links like and board things. Board minutes for our fiduciary check out, review. Check out the Plan Sponsor <laughs> Magazine article that we're talking about, and then they give mention to a Morningstar white paper, right? And the Morningstar white paper is titled "The Glide Path Selection Problem: A Quantitative Approach to Assessing Glide." Yeah, blah blah blah. Um, so in like it, you wrote that. In it, there's an interesting graph. I'm a nerd. And it, it talks about all the target date funds that are out there and then it and their glide pass and it puts them on a graph and then it says, here's the glide pass of the top five target date funds based on total assets. And I thought it was really interesting because those five have a pretty similar glide path, which tells me that and you kind of made mention of this, one, these are very well marketed target date funds. Yeah. Vanguard, Fidelity, T Row. I don't know the top five. Sorry, I should have done my homework. But, but Didn't secondly, you say the top five are right in front of you. No, to give you names. Just the graph, just the graph. But I'm just saying they follow a very similar vibe. So maybe it's a popular kind of glide path too. I don't know. Food for thought. The funny thing is, when you look at that though, it's, they're, they're, hey, nobody you have two else can through. see it. So. You have it's different a, methodologies in terms of two versus It's a lot more similar both. than the others. But the glide paths are Here all what? almost Brand identical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a couple. I'll fall off a little bit. Um, okay, with that, I would like to move into, as I've always mentioned, my favorite part of the show. Dun, dun, but this dun, time, dun, it's not my favorite part of the show because it's the wheel of ice. I think that's great. The wheel's going to come out. We're going to spin it. Mark's going to lose. He's going to drink a smear enough ice. So that's great. Let's get this over with, please. <laughs> but I'm also adding to this, as I did a few episodes ago, the quiz of death. Dun, dun, oh, good. Dun, so that applies to him and only. Usually, Chad's well, getting nervous. You know what? Here. I like to keep you guys on your toes. Yeah. And this time, maybe it's not Chad. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Maybe it's uh -oh. I see it. I see Quiz of Death as the very last line item that JD sent out in topics for this week. And I'm yep. going, this sucks. And well, Justin I actually try to, tried to, tried to uh, IM me and be like, hey, can you tell me about the Quiz of Death? And I'm like, nope. Because I didn't think it would right, be on us. All right, spin it. Mark's going to lose. Get a smear off ice. For the quiz of death, I will need Whee! some some duct winner, tape. Winner, winner! Can I get some duct tape? I'm sorry. And? What? Yes. Okay. So we're gonna need some duct tape, and I'm gonna ask a quiz question. Um, oh dear lord. Chad can't see this because it's actually not gonna be Justin or Mark. I, it's gonna be Chad. Oh, I was gonna yeah. say, am I part of it? Brand How dare you? Yeah, this works. Oh, this um, is gonna go on your Can I see your? Can we great. get these skinny jeans up so I can see those big fat calves you have? Jeez. Look who's wearing dress oh, socks wow. with slip-ons. Can we get a close-up on that, maybe? Sorry, sorry. That's some hair. And this duct tape's going to take off some of that hair. If I hate the quiz of death because it continues to go until I don't get something right. It's like a little I may dog. I well just get it wrong now, quickly. I'm not going to put it on until we know that you get this wrong. And Well, I appreciate that. I think you should tear off a nut that goes all the way around the calf. 
Justin, Ooh, around? I think Can we should be like quiet. Yeah. Can I like do that? Right. chest hair? The question is, and I'd like to give him 10 seconds to answer this question. So maybe okay. it could be the clock. If I get it right, you two get pulled. If you have Fine. a plan Deal. with $2,355,000, $2,355,000, and your advisor is taking 35 basis points compensation, <laughs> so what would his That's comp be, his or her? 2355 and 35. 8242 8, dollars and 50 cents. <laughs> I went in 10s and then I multiplied it by 3 and then I tried to make up for what the 5 would be. Oh. That was a terrible question. Oh my by god. The way. <laughs> this is a terrible question for this, by the way. <laughs> Let it marinate a little bit there. Yeah. Oh this actually God. doesn't feel that sticky. I'm not too worried. No, it's not going to do anything. You should have gone against the grain. Just pull against One, the grain. One, two. <laughs> 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 show the hair. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. You got plenty. Oh, shoot. I'm mic'd up. Sorry. Right. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. All right, Chad. I thought you'd get that one. That still you just is got, not. You just got manscaped. The taser was the worst so far. So that's we'll not that up. bad. We have some other ideas. That's not that bad. We have some other ideas. I was kind of hoping like a Steve Carell shout out like Kelly Clarkson yeah. or something. Yeah. And Mark, like, Kelly well, you have to wax me to make yeah. it painful for that. I wasn't paying attention, but the oh. smearing off I see is over there. That went down smoothly. So it's good. good. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. That was a, um, a, a 2016 Smirnoff ice uh, brewed right. in the mountains of Smirnoff. Our, our, our last segment here is the <laughs> 411. Okay. And we are talking about some lawsuits, or kind of one in particular, but in general starting to go down market. Um, we are so used to Wee. lawsuits on big, large plans with hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars, and now hitting the press is <laughs> our Someone needs to tell him to be quiet. Why? He's working is, unlike uh, us. There's a lawsuit on a plan He's that is less plans that we've than $10 million. Um, and so... What's the you, name of the case so everyone knows? Well, you guys tell me. That wasn't part of the study materials. Um, I'm trying to pull it up. Here we go. So there's an article called, Who Says Only Big Plans Get Sued? by Mr. Nevin Adams at NapaNet. And the case is Damberg versus Lemetri's Collision, Inc. So it's a, uh, it's a Minnesota plan with less than $10 million in assets and 114 participants. And the lawsuit centers around what? Uh, a share class? Not being appropriate, being too expensive. Well, I, I would say, in general terms, re reasonable yeah. fees for participants. That's exactly what I was going to say. Let's Great. start there, because I think the, Which, the majority of people are going to say it's about excessive fees. Is I don't know what it's titled. Yeah, but in, I'm, I'm still very, very confused on where they came to. It should be so in, in it they name that it should be eighteen dollars per participant on average annually. Let's okay. talk about the case first. Yeah, let's talk about the case first. But that it wasn't. I was kind of caught off guard by that. Yeah, that's. Um, they also say, and I'm, I'm not going to quote the article, but the article here. But they also say that uh, they feel like there was no oversight. Right. They feel like there is no fiduciary process. Be valid. Right. So what's the, a fiduciary? <laughs> the um, so basically they're saying, hey, these people were at the the steering wheel of our plan, right? The committee, the, the trustees. Did the employees file a suit, a civil suit? Yeah, with mm -hmm. the, with an attorney, right? Okay. Um, that's what these attorneys do. They try to go out there and find their people. And uh, this 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 law firm looks like they want to go after others. And they've clearly, this is why this is newsworthy, is because usually these attorneys would go after a Big far bigger fish. payoff mm -hmm. as opposed to this smaller plan. So, And the justification has always been the fines, the compensation for those folks sure. has to do with a right. percentage of assets. So you pick a smaller pay and you get paid less. And so that's why they go after the big fish. And so kind of my question for you guys is, does this change the current landscape of what you and your advisors talk to plan sponsors about? Yes, Can I absolutely. first start that? It's, we've kind of always gone to them and said, them being plan sponsors, like, hey, man, you need to keep your ducks in a row. You need to dot your I's and your T's. And why did we say that? Because we're like, because you could get sued, right? right? 
but now maybe you can say, yeah, you really can. Like it's happening. Where before it was kind of up market. Yeah. Which is why it's even yeah. more important to do what we always say: document, document, document. I think yeah. it's. I think it's very common to hear folks say that they started a plan. It was set up well. They were happy with it. Nothing was really going wrong. So an advisor would proactively reach out to say we should sit down every year to discuss your plan. And they would just say, I don't have time for it. It's kind of a, I would call it, you can tell me what you would call it, but a set it and forget it approach where they yeah. thought like, we set it up, everything was fine. I do the contributions. I'm on time. I signed my 5500. Everything's going smoothly. But they don't think about the bigger picture, right? Mind about growth. all the nuances, the fees and the, the funds and everything else that you're thinking about. And I think maybe advisors need to be a little bit more... Uh, stern to say, you have we to have to this. sit down. I, I need I've, you to sign off on this. I've seen many advisors get, slide a service agreement, which we've talked about in the past, mm -hmm. slide a service agreement across the table to a client and say, I'm going to sign this and you're going to sign this. And because of that, you have to let me come in every year and do my fiduciary review. Yeah, we get it that you're busy, but it takes 30 minutes. We've got to get down together, once a I'll year. Post it, yeah. and you just got to be there. You, I was having that whomever. conversation yesterday. Uh, with a Southern California advisor where I was saying, hey, I, I think a great opportunity for you is to walk in and say, I'm going to demand that this happens. Yeah. So unlike a lot of my Let's peers, I'm not going to take no for an answer. We're going to make sure, I'm going to take responsibility to make sure we check those boxes, get these meetings done, document it, put it away, et cetera, et cetera. But let's, let's go deep Let me briefly this. clarify, though, what the issue was with the fees here, because there are some folks who do fiduciary reviews. And let's be honest, we've all sat in them. What do they do? They review plan participation. They review prudence of the plan itself. When they get into costs, they review the costs. They don't review the prudence necessarily, but they often review the costs. There's no benchmark. If they are them. doing a benchmarking even, they, they often do an overall benchmarking and not necessarily what this is pointing out to be the issue, which is a share class benchmarking. And so I always give the example to folks when we talk about the cost of a mutual fund, the difference between share classes. So we know A share, B share, C share, T share, I share, institutional, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, Admiral. There's all these different share classes. Y. y shares. T shares. Forgot Z. about T yeah. shares too. You said T Z shares. shares. My goodness. C shares. The end result is in the, in the analogy that I always give is if I wanted to go buy a soda and I walked the vending machine downstairs, I could buy a soda for a dollar, let's just say. If I went to Not Disneyland. Nowadays. No way. If I went to Disneyland and I wanted to buy the exact same bottle of soda Another twelve ounce bottle of soda. Four fifty. It's going to cost me four fifty or five dollars. Dude, Mickey Mouse be. has to get paid. That's my point, though. These shared classes have different costs. It's the same bottle of soda yeah. with different costs built around them. And so, what this lawsuit and what Tussie versus ABB Inc. and some of these others oh, have been is that they're looking at there and they're they're looking that's at the share class and they're saying, based upon your assets, you could have a better one. You could have a better one. But why aren't you making Why that aren't happen? you looking at that and, and going to your vendor and saying, we want a lower share class? Yeah. And that's, it's not necessarily about the overall fee, it's about the share class that those funds are in. We just talked about this a second ago, but then why not just give Vanguard to everybody then? Because it's not about passive versus active or necessarily cost of the type of fund. Hey, I'm, just play, I'm just share playing classes. both sides so of the field. No, yeah, I think that that's, that's a natural fair. response. Right. But, Absolutely. But, but share class does not mean active versus Thank passive. You. Okay, so you can have a passive fund that has a higher share class. When, when people argue for Vanguard, what inevitably they're arguing is, I want an institutional share class of an index fund. That's kind of the concept yeah. there. So this is about share class, and you, you hit the nail on the head. Hey, if there's something better available to you that you could get your hands on. For the exact same fund. And you're not doing it, then you're doing a disservice to your plan participants. Exactly. And maybe that's where these lawsuits are coming who, from. And who do you think, so you say a disservice, so who do you think that falls to? Oh, I love that you asked that. Because I asked Chad that earlier, like, is it the vendor's fault for not coming back and saying, geez, we're making too way, much money yeah. on you guys. We could have just offered you this. Right. And, um, and our kind of consensus is, currently, the first, the buck's going to stop with the plan sponsor. It's going to stop with the fiduciaries, like the people there that are in charge of this um and so i think yeah that's by the way when you have a plaintiff and 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 they're suing you know this whole lawsuit's going down it's not naming the vendor right true it's, although there are although they, there i do. will say that there is a particular record keeper that's mentioned in that article yeah. 
But um, I guess I think it's really important to fixate on who we're trying to protect. We're trying who, to protect the plan sponsor, and so they're the ones. Well, that so, so aside and, and from who the responsibility is, who should be having that conversation with the plan sponsor? Because they're advisor. the advisor. Exactly. Right. In all reality, that client is not. They don't know the 401k world well enough to have that conversation. But the advisor can come to them and say, hey, we started you off as a startup plan. You're now $8 million. You're still sitting in, in R3 share class. Well, that, that conversation should be had well before they hit $8 million, though. Well, I'm just stating that, that yeah, this, that and we run into this all the time. I'm going to see a case down in SoCal exist. next week where they're still sitting in A shares and they're $7.5 million. Doesn't Isn't exist. SoCal your territory? Yeah, but there was, there was three specific. <laughs> oh, two. come on, man. Let's go to, Justin brought it up, just just so our audience knows, you know, if they read this article. I did find it interesting. It's probably going to get us off track here, but it did say that, that this lawsuit was claiming that a reasonable annual per capita fee paid by the retirement plan participants should not exceed 18 bucks. Can you, on, can you also specify the percentage over they were paying? Right. Forty nine hundred percent more well, than they So should they have. said that that actually <laughs> each participant was paying eight hundred and eighty six dollars. Which equates or 4, to forty nine hundred, four thousand nine hundred percent and higher. These stats <laughs> are based off of participant counts of that's 100 a hundred more. That's a but, little excessive. But do the math for me on that for a second. It, I said one hundred and fourteen participants. Yeah. What's one hundred and fourteen times eighteen dollars? Right. I call BS yeah. on that. Sorry, well, I'm so all for prudent fees. But, that's, so, yeah. but we were just talking about this earlier. Is that specifically what they should be paying for record keeping fees? That's exactly uh, what I was thinking. Okay. Probably, yeah. maybe. Who knows? So, sorry not to let you finish your point. I think what you're getting at is you have cost of investments, you have cost of record keeping, you have cost of administration, yeah. you have cost of advisor comp. It cannot be all in. That Some low companies $2, aggregate those. Yeah. Some break them apart. You get institutional, and then you break each of those apart. Um, and so it depends. I recently wrote a blog post. What? <laughs> no. And hold wait, on. wait, 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 wait. Yeah, clap. For <laughs> What's the name of your website? So I hope Brandon can, can put it, it in here. F O U R four hundred one K O one K dot com. Dot com. Um, and I did write an article about uh, this concept of um, shifting fees from the participants to the plan sponsor. So I want to wrap this kind of litigation lawsuit conversation with this. A great way to solve this problem is start to take those costs and instead of having them be $18 per participant or $886 per participant, and start to make them a business cost. And if the employer is writing a check for those services, you're lowering your response, your uh, liability in a, in a huge way. So something for our audience to kind of chew on is, you know, start thinking about solutions where maybe Tom, Joe, and, and Mary, the participants, aren't flipping the bill for the whole darn thing all the time. I know that's kind of earth shattering concept. And, I wouldn't say that it And is. the plan sponsor's picking up the tab. Yeah. Um, it's easy to communicate deduction. to your participants when you don't have to tell them the different types of fees. You're just like, your investment costs, yes. that's the cost, that's yeah. what you pay. Which is an argument we haven't even chatted about on this no. show at all. Which Next is time. But it's NAV. You know, yeah. there are providers out there that say, we won't give you institutional, but we'll give you NAV, and therefore the only cost of the mutual fund anyway is you're in a higher cost share class. Which is back to kind of this yeah, conversation. Yeah, back to the same problem. But so I'm well, just, I, my we, we do have audience members that aren't in our industry. Can you say what NAV stands for? Net asset value. Thank you. Um, I actually was, didn't know what it was. He was doing so. that because he was trying to figure out what it yeah, was. No, yeah. but, um, I just learned something. <laughs> my simple, like, nav, my, my point is very simple, is that if you have costs and the majority of those costs are being borne by the participants, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily has to go away, but just, just be aware of that and you want to change that and you want to make it a safer, less litigious, you know, situation. Wow. That's a word, right? I like that. Um, it sounds like it is. It sounds yeah, sexy. Yeah, it should be. Mm -hmm. um, it is. Um, you move those costs to the plan yeah. sponsor. We, we, right, we have this conversation constantly because right. of the, the, the tax implications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's Sorry, but the cold hard fact, though, is it's, it's not, I would argue it's not as easy as it sounds because it's, it's an uncomfortable conversation. Conversation to have. I think in my article I said you need to grow a cold pair. hard facts. You need to grow wow. a pair if you're going to do it. Like you got to have some. I don't think so. I don't it's struggle. struggle. Well, a lot of times the person you're sitting with is paying the majority of the fees anyways because they have exactly the majority right. of the assets. On a so plan. it's actually an easy conversation to have, at least True. 
from my experience. A lot of people yeah, commented agree. on the blog. Did you say reviews. cold hard facts? Possibly. I don't know. That's <laughs> nice, man. Have cold that hashtag or something. <laughs> That was um, stolen from somewhere. So, it? anyways, ESPN. for advisors, <laughs> uh, for industry <laughs> professionals, <laughs> everyone out there that's watching this show, you know, think about those concepts. Um, definitely, when you're talking to plan sponsors these days, let them know that these lawsuits are coming down market, and therefore it is important. That's one to make that sure we've got had an process. example of, but I'm sure there are others similar to that. And there's, with the amount of Auditors that have been hired, I'm sure lawyers are also out there looking for their share. Yeah. The final Absolutely. paragraph of this article, Mark, says, Oh, and this may not be the last we hear from the law firm representing the plaintiffs. Medea Law, LLC of Minneapolis. That's where my wife's from, by the way. Um, Hi, Tracy. The homepage of their website says, Goliath, beware. We're trial lawyers. Our core competency above everything else is trying cases to juries, and we specialize in beating giants. So, anyways, they're just saying. Wow. Yeah, we're gonna, and they're going after this it's a, it's nine power, million power dollar move, plan. Power so move. We'll go yeah. more. Um, thank you for attending episode number fourteen of Retire Holland. You just Where earned we do what? 0. 0.65 CE credits for your <laughs> ongoing <laughs> education. Chris, you're qualified to give CE credits. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome if retired all yeah. you CE well, just, You keep just, thinking yeah. ASPA is going to talk about Just email me, wow. I'll sign right off on that puppy. Um, you just gave me a great idea. That's not possible. Jeez. <laughs> Sorry, you can't give CE credits when you're drinking beer. <laughs> Maybe that's part of it. Um, thank you for attending. Thank you for all of, uh, of your feedback, your comments, your interaction. Um, keep it up. Yeah. And um, we will keep doing this. Um, as long we, as they let us. We, no, we're going to keep doing it forever, even if they stop watching. <laughs> we'll that, right? If no website watches. URL gets blocked, but we'll still keep doing it. We're going to keep doing I'm it no matter what. So. Just sit on the couch and have some beers with you guys. There you go. Alrighty. Um, changing. The 401k, 403b, profit sharing, uh, defined, defined benefit, benefit, cash balance plan industry. ESOPs. No. Nah, One bad. beer. Deferred call. Nope. Thank you. Cheers. Mary, Mary, bleep or kill? Let's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> All right, I'm going to marry JD. Nice. Oh. You're I'd, a good husband. I'd bleep, I'd bleep Chad for sure. <laughs> I'll kill Justin. Yeah.